Alright folks, so we go on to part three of the trio of trio movie reviews here. Well, time to talk about the third movies of each trilogy. As I have before, we'll start with The Mummy. Now, this one. The cast leaves Egypt, and instead they travel to China to deal with the Dragon Emperor, Shi Huan Di, whatever you want to call him. And oddly enough, they never mention the fact that he is called Shi Huan Di, and they don't really refer to him as the Dragon Emperor really that much. He's just the Emperor. Hmm. So, getting into uh, what I like about the movie. Well, um, having the characters grown up, I'll admit, it kind of alienates me, but in a way, it adds a little more complexity and more emotional, um, well, needed to make the acting work and all that. So, I saw them meet the demands of the movie fairly well. You've got Alex, who's now, like, the somewhat cocky, uh, 20 year old person like what tons of 20 like people are like that let's face it it is like that come on and then um brendan frazier he has to deal with the father who is somewhat disappointed with the son but knows that in a way he's kind of dropped the ball and all that and evie she's gonna deal with not being satisfied with the uh toned down nature of how life's turned out because in the first movie she's not satisfied with just being a simple librarian she wants to do something with her life the second movie she just wants to find more things because she realizes she likes to do that in the third movie she swore that they would settle down as a ww2 but she's just not satisfied even have to be successful with her being a writer enough money to settle down just she's just not happy and pff, I think that's a great story arc. You would kind of think it's the opposite. You would think Brendan Fraser would be the one saying, oh, let's just get going. But I'm glad that they reversed that. Um, hmm. What else did I like about this movie? Well, demonstrating, like, all the powers of Shu, the Dragon Emperor, doing all the mastery of the elements and all that, and then also the, uh, Utilizing the army that surrounds his tomb, and then utilizing the army that's like buried under the great wall. That's very amazing. I never would have thought about using the people that are underneath the great wall. I never would have thought of that, even though I've learned that repeatedly in history class and all that. That detail just completely slipped my mind. And then, yeah. Also, the uh, temple curses or devices that are surrounding Shu Huan. These two, sorry that I keep him saying that one of his two names, you know who I mean. But the ones that are surrounding it, I'm glad, those are very good devices, they feel different than the previous two movies, and I'm glad that this movie for once does not have a temple collapsing around everyone. I mean, like, come on, that's just, ugh. Leaving Egypt, I originally thought that that wouldn't work well, but... I think it worked out just fine. We got different terrain and all that, so people had to use different survival techniques. And then it's oh, and like that um argument um between Brendan Fraser and Alex that kind of sets the metaphor for the entire movie. Because Brendan Fraser's just like, so let's just attack these moves the old fashioned way, he puts out his Thompson. But um Alex is just like, no, things are different now, Dad. He brings up that, um, more powerful machine gun thingy. He's like, we use these now. Yeah, because, you get, Brendan Fraser, you don't get it, do you? This isn't you against one or two mummies this time and then have everyone else, like, fought off the army or the powers. This time, it's a whole army and you don't have enough people to fight the army. Um, the adding of the witch, I forget her name, and her daughter, daughter, Yen, uh, uh, Yen, I don't know, I can't pronounce these names, sorry, I just suck at names. They're adding to the plot, um, that's not too bad, it does help 
tie together all the curses because it gives you um someone that you well know into the plot and honestly i'm surprised that they didn't say that the witch died at the beginning of the movie and not have like a brotherhood of followers which is something that you would expect that they actually have her there impressive and then um that snow battle in there yeah i enjoy that and also those yeti oh yeah good stuff um, and the whole action sequences that take place in Shanghai for once, there aren't any jokes, and they utilize the dawn terrain, it isn't totally confusing and random, the villains all act predictably, and very enjoyable. Uh... And also the way all the concluding bits tie in. I feel like they wrap the characters up appropriately in a way that doesn't seem cheesy at all. And then uh, the um, witch and her daughter needing to give up their immortality for the cur to um, get the um, people from the great underneath the great wall. Mm -hmm. And then Jonathan in this movie, I like how they sort of tune down his jokes. He's needed a lot more. Sure, he's scared. But all he does is go, oh god, oh god, well, everyone else is, I'm thinking the same thing, but I'm not showing it. I think that wipes up the positives, so let's talk about the negatives. Well, you have to be honest, this movie feels different. It isn't a bad difference, but, you know, you just get used to one atmosphere, and... And uh, this isn't a complete negative, it's just possible to um, say that this movie, like Mummy Returns, is more for the eye candy. Now, I didn't really feel like this was more about the eye candy, visual effects, and all of that. I thought this had a good story embedded within the visual effects. Mummy Returns wasn't bad at that, but you could tell it relied a lot more on the visual effects. Well, the first movie didn't rely on that at all. Because the plot of the movie was enough, you could easily write out the visual effects. Here, you registered the visual effects, but the plot is still very good. Oh, and we got the battle between armies that we were dying for, because in Mummy Returns, you know, the jackals just boop, disappear before they can attack the uh, temple guys. Um, in the... So, back to negatives. In the... Uh, I see, yeah, it was fight and all that. Um, okay, this is just the biggest thing that I hate about that entire fight. Why the hell didn't you guys blow up the damn bridge? Why? Huh? I mean, like, because you didn't, all the Chinese guys were able to, like, get over there, you wasted most of your ammunition trying to fight them, so you weren't really able to blow up the tower, which is what you wanted, and just, oh my god, I mean, like, how did you guys have done that? The Dragon Emperor would have had to, like, you know, master the elements to create his own bridge across, or he could just, I don't know, jump the gap, and then everyone else would just have to shoot a couple of... just shoot all the Chinese people that are on the other side, unable to help them, so it'll be just the Emperor. Oh, come on! Why didn't you guys blow up the bridge? Why? And then, uh, like with the other two movies, the, uh, the, uh, villain person trying to revive the mummy, and the ruler obviously says, I don't need you, just, why do we have these characters? Come on. And the way that that general guy went out was stupid. I mean, like, his companion grabs onto him, and then he says, let go, but she doesn't, and they both get crushed by gears in the Great Wall. Uh, oh, and wait a minute, how are the gears on the Great Wall? And that didn't even look like the Great Wall. I mean, like, we got several shots of the Great Wall throughout the movie, but that didn't look like the Great Wall. I'm sorry, it didn't. And also the fact that the, uh, witch, I keep forgetting her name, I'm sorry, died and all that. Oh, come on, I mean, who didn't see it coming that either her or her daughter died? Come on. 
it was just so obvious. I, it's just, I've watched enough movies to tell that one of them was going to have to die. Hmm. And, um, I gotta be honest, the uh, chemistry between Alex and Yen just, eh. I mean, like, it's managed okay, but you gotta admit, there's the standard cheesy awkwardness, and Alex is just like, besides, you're not my type. Uh, almost every time someone says that in the movie, they actually are attracted to that person. <sighs> and the whole bit about be that uh, she can't be with Alex because she can't live forever. Uh, Alex, come on. Isn't it obvious? She's gonna stay that age, a year or two younger than you, forever. And then also, um, how did the witch and her daughter get that immortality? How? What did the Yeti do to help? Oh, oh, oh no, 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 oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. They were by the pool of eternal life. I'm sorry. And two final dislikes. Um, what's up with not, you know, shooting the top of the tower off or just trying to do it so he can't uh, set the eye in there? And then saying that mummies were later found in Peru. Really? You had to? Yeah. So on the whole, um, it's an enjoyable enough movie. You guys will have your own opinions about it. I've enjoyed all three movies for what they are. I'd have to say, um, Returns is the worst, this is number two, even though Roger Ebert surprisingly calls this the best in the series, which kind of surprises me. Because I'm used to, um, not liking what this guy says, because he hates the movie The Natural, when I think it's a pretty good movie. Not as great as everyone says, yeah, but that's his off topic. So, um, I think I'll give Tomb of Dragon Emperor 4 out of 5, even though I think the rating might change over time, and I don't think I'll be watching it anytime soon, and all that. This is a movie I'm gonna go years without seeing, and, like, the two other movies before it. Ooh, that went on for a while. Now for X3. So, going into this movie, I know what a lot of people say about this movie. They hate it, and that it brings down the franchise. Well, I viewed it, and I sort of agree with you guys, and I sort of don't. Positives and negatives, remember? So, positives. Um, well, first of all, we do learn what the heck was up with Jean Grey, which, in a way, sort of makes sense, how in X2 she was going... And all that. Um, I actually felt some emotion for Cyclops in this one, unlike the uh, other two, so I was glad to at least have one moment where I'm not looking at this guy going, eh. Um... Magneto, we get one of the best lines from him in this, where he's saying that he actually hates the fact that Professor X died. I was really glad that we included that line, because, like, in the comics, well, at least the very, very, very early issues of the X-Men that I've read, Magneto's just another villain. Just some random guy that they write in, but in this movie, they, we finally get a little bit more of the relationship he and Xavier had. He's just like, I pity that he had to die to make the... Oh, Sells a better world, us meaning the mutants. I'm glad that that was in there. Also, getting to see some more superheroes with their powers, I'm glad that we have that. We get some more bad A lines from Wolverine. I don't, because like in the second one, I don't feel like we got that many lines from him. I was kind of disappointed with that, even though I didn't mention that. But in this one, we go right back to that. I'm glad of that. Getting a little bit more leadership qualities from Storm? I think that's a good move, because even though technically Cyclops is supposed to be the next in command, in these movies, you know he wouldn't last at all, even in the first one. So in here, Storm goes in there, and she fits the leadership role decently. 
She doesn't resonate the natural born leader feel that Xavier has, but it's good. Um, hmm. Adding the characters of, like, uh, Beast, um, expanding Iceman and extending Pyro and continuing the Mystique storyline. That's all good. Um, adding in Juggernaut. Not bad. So I think we've covered character additions. Um, the fight scenes in this movie, okay, they're hella awesome. I mean, like, this is the superhero movie, at least up to the time. I, I'm not so sure if it stands up to more recent superhero movies, where we get the uh, max multi-character fight, just a big, all-out, warlike fights that we want in superhero movies. You know, the type of fights that last way longer than 10 minutes... Uh, have a lot of uh, shifting character focuses going on. Not so complex that we, you know, can't tell who's fighting who, but we see multiple things happening. And just uh, 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 brilliant. And I also love how this movie created, like, emotions in me. Because, like, there's a couple of times where, like, a few characters, pardon me, got hit and all that, and then they... Sheesh. Well, they got hit, and then they landed on stuff, I just went, ooh! And the bits were like, Mystique and Magneto got the superhero cure into them. I go, oh! Because, like, well, face it, if Magneto loses his superpowers, he's nothing. Because, like, he resonates all the natural born qualities of the leader and all that, and then he takes away his powers. He's just an ordinary, older human being, and I'm just like, oh! Man, I can't really explain it that much more. And Mystique, she loves her pals and she wanted to serve Magneto and then she loses it and then Magneto's like, you know, I want to go one of us and he leaves. That is powerful. I love that scene. Even though it does make the entire couple minutes before useless, I enjoy that. And then, like, the whole metaphor about how they say the cure is voluntary, but it can be used as, like, a weapon and all that. In a way, yeah. I could feel myself sympathizing on both sides of the cause in this situation. Whereas, um, in the past two movies, I was pretty much for Xavier, even though I didn't really hate Magneto as a bad guy. Because, in a way, I just sensed that there was more to him. And, you know, the villain of Magneto in these movies, very enjoyable. Um, how, like, the army is defeated and all that, uh, it's enjoyable. All of those scenes, Magneto, Juggo, Not, Pyro, uh, Gene, all done well, and all the other guys. Anything else I want to comment on? Oh, and I love how we get some more, we continue to get some more of, like, the younger X-Men, Iceman, Rogue, Kitty, the girl who walks through the walls, and how we also get some more out of Rogue, because I really like Rogue. Okay, moving on to the negatives. Well, there's some nitpicks and some really glaring issues. Well, first of all, let's tackle the nitpicks. It seems like Kitty's changed hair color. Because I could have sworn in X2 she was more blonde or brownish, and here she's got um, darker hair. I, that's just a mild complaint. Also, I'm kind of surprised how there's only um, six willing X-Men to do anything. Well, seven if you include Angel. I'm just thinking that there could be a few more people willing to help. I mean, like, we don't really feature anyone, but... I'm just kind of complaining. Uh, I'm surprised that, like, Magneto willingly throwing away Mystique is just that simple. He's just like, I only want the mutants to help, even though she was a mutant, and she is his most devoted follower. She was with him from the beginning. So I'm just surprised that he's willing to throw someone out like that much. And then, um... Xavier not telling anyone about, um, 
Jean Grey's powers. Why didn't you tell anyone? Now, I'm now not telling Wolverine, I get, and not telling Cyclops, I get, but why didn't you tell Storm? Oh, oh but wait, oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Jean could have read their minds or done something to their minds. Sorry. That makes sense now. Uh, where did all these classes of superheroes come from? That sounds like something that was purely taken from the comics. And also the same thing with the simulation room and the Sentinel bits. Even though they are mentioned really by name, it just seems like they're just there because they're in a comic book. And also, like, the, uh, Jean Grey turning into the Phoenix thing. I mean, like, they could, I mean, like, there aren't that many other ways to do it, but it seems like in this movie it just really is there because of a comic book thing. Same thing really with this movie, in a way. It just seems to be a lot more action this period because it happens in the comics. I did enjoy the action, but in a way, it does feel like a comic book transferred directly to the movie. That this um, new president of the United States, I don't like this guy. The president of the first two was better, way better. Um. Hmm. Rogue, really she's just there to get her powers removed and just say, I want to go without my powers. I do like it in a way, but in a way she's just there purely to just get the actor to come back in a way, it seems. Um, Cyclops, he's really in this movie just to be killed. So that effectively really makes his character throughout the trilogy completely useless. So I know some fans are going to be pissed by that. Um, I think Magneto could have possibly done a little more to try and stop Gene from killing... Ch uh, Xavier? Um, and also, why does Magneto send half his darn army to be, um, cured and all that? It's just, you're just wasting troops. And it also seems like he has more people than they actually show in various shots, because, like, um, when he's clearing the calls on the, uh, Golden Gate to get to Alcatraz and all that, I did a head count, and I, I could tell by based on the amount of people that there was about 60 of them. Now, about 30 get shot as they're running out, and he describes them as the pawns. He then sends everyone else to get a, out there. There's at least 45. I didn't count them, but you can get that feel. Um... I kind of hate that Wolverine didn't get as huge of a story impact into here. I mean, like, we don't get anything to do with his character. Now, albeit, there isn't that much more that could have happened, but it's just a bummer that that trait suddenly just ends. Uh, hmm. Angel? Well, his character in there is virtually useless. I mean, like... He's doing it for basically the opposite of Rogue in a way, but I just don't think that character had any real meaning. I mean, like, it's there just to show him trying to scrape off the wings, resist his father, say, I heard this was a safe place for mutants, and then save his father. You could have done without that! You could have just had the guy be a scientist. You just could have. <sighs> okay, there's a couple of other nitpicks in here, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who has these nitpicks. Yeah. So, I don't think this movie is as bad as people out there say it is. Do I think this movie ruins the franchise? No. Is this a step down from the other two? Hell yeah, it is! So, um, I'm gonna rate this, I think. <sighs> On a crit... Critiquing level... Okay, I'm gonna give this two ratings. A critique and turning my brain off. Critiquing level three. Turning my brain off, just having a fun time, which is what I wanted for the X movies to begin with. Four. Criticize me all you want. I know this is a step down from the other movies, but this isn't a piece of beep, like a lot of you say it is. In my opinion. Mm-hmm. But then again, I haven't read as many X-Men as pretty much every single person who calls this movie beep. Okay, you gotta admit, that's a fair statement. Okay, two down, or eight down, one to go. 
Transformers Dark of the Moon. Well, hmm. This was a pretty interesting bag to me. I was expecting this movie to be, you know, like a bit of an improvement from Dark of the Moon like a lot of people seem to think it is. After all, this movie made a billion. And in some ways it was, but I didn't really feel it. I mean, like, for the other Transformers movies, for the first one, I thought it was a very good movie, and it deserved positive reviews. The second movie, I thought it was an action, purely action flick all the way. It deserved the bad reviews, but it deserved all the money it made, and I did enjoy for being an action flick. This movie, I was told that, you know, it would be better, it has a bit more of a plot to it and all that, and... Yeah, it does have more of a plot to it, but I was just didn't exactly get the biggest feel that this movie was better. It's odd. I can't really explain it. But, well, let's get into the positives. Um, first of all, I love the fact that Sam's parents don't really show up in this movie that often. I mean, like, they're, they're annoying. They don't add anything. But, uh, yeah. I just love how they were tuned down. Uh, also, like, the, uh, racial puns that were in number two, I'm glad that they got rid of that. Come on, that really made the movie bad and all that. Pun. Also, I like how in this one, Sam's girlfriend, Carly, is a little more important to the story. I mean, like, Megan Fox, she did add some complexity to the story, because in the first one, she has got the criminal past and all that, and she helps drive Bumblebee around... And also trying to give Sam a bit of a companion other than Bumblebee. And then in the second one, Sam's just losing grip of his life, both in like everything. And she's one example of that, so it's helpful. But in this one, it's not, it's, it's kind of the same thing. But also, she's in some ways involved with the bad guy. And then she also has direct talks with the bad guys. She has way big influence over this movie, whilst Megan Fox did it. So, in a way, I like that. Uh, hmm. Also, I love how Shia LaBeouf has to get into, like, some more violence in this movie. I like that, because in the first two movies, he has to get himself out of trouble, and then he grabs a mist, uh, transform a device, and then use it, but get beat up in the process. Here, he just has to stop a device of being used, and then he gets beat up, but beats people up also, and then has to make strategic decisions. Mm-hmm. What they do with the, uh, Agent Simmons, I think his name is, yeah, and I also like the fact that, like, in the previous two movies, the soldier guys return, and I love that they don't go back to that, uh, village in the desert. Thank you. The action scenes in this movie, brilliant. This is the Transformer movie with action scenes that are just uh, extremely good. I mean, like, here they last a little bit longer than 10 minutes. Well, actually, no, 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 way longer than 10 minutes. Heck, they take up, like, almost an entire hour of the movie with all the fending for their live scene and distress. So, that's all handled well. Just that whole Chicago thing, yeah. And the building thing, mm-hmm. Uh, the Autobots, uh, what they did with them is just as good as the other two movies, I feel. Autobots Prime delivers more speeches and all that. They make it seem like they leave, but they, uh, actually don't leave. I knew they were going to come back, but I couldn't give you a reason why. And although I did notice that one of the rocket tubes, you know, appeared to be a bit more intact than other parts that were blowing up, I didn't give it any thought. And then they revealed that that's what it was, even though they didn't give it any more screen time. You just noticed that it was one more part than was intact. Mm hmm Whew. Uh, hmm. Also, I like how um, Altruist Prime and Sentinel Prime, their relationship handled well. Also, it ties together a couple of the other things that were happening in the... Uh, First movie, why? Well, one reason why Mega Tron uh, or Megabot, I forget which one it is, sorry, was trying to go to uh, Earth in the first place. Other than just to look at the cube, he was just supposed to wait to, for a Sentinel. Mm hmm. Uh, 
but there's something else I need to touch on that. I'll tell you in a minute. Um, this film really does carry a bit of concluding's nature to it, as Megatron actually gets pulled apart and all that, along with all the other Decepticons. Which is enjoyable, because this was intended to be the last Transformers movie, even though Michael Bay's working on making another one, even though Shia LaBeouf isn't coming back. And also, I love how we finally get, like, a huge big invasion. I mean, like, you could say we got that in the fir first two, but not really. Because in the first one, everyone was already there, just hiding. In the second movie, we get one additional, um... Decepticon, and then likewise, everyone else was already there. In this one, we actually get a lot more coming. They are going for absolute carnage, bring the planet, and all that, and just vanquish everyone, and then slave, and then just shoot all the people up. But I think that's enough of the positives that I've got to address, so negatives. Um... So, I said that this movie kind of explains what Megatron was going to Earth. Um, yeah, it does explain that, but here's one problem. There's a big plot hole. Because it shows... Because what the way that they're describing it is that Megatron went to Earth first, wanted to see if he could locate the Allspark, and then to wait for Sentinel. That's what it basically seems like. And then the Sentinel's ship escapes during the war, and then crushes onto the moon. So you would, even though that wasn't the intention, so you would think that they were able to meet up, but here's the problem. Sam's great-great-great-grandfather finds Megatron buried under the ice in 1897. Sentinel's ship crashes into the moon in 1961. That's 65 years later, or 64, one of the two. So, why does Megatron want to wait 64 years before Sentinel shows up? It doesn't make sense. So there's a big plot hole. And then also, if Megatron was going to wait for Sentinel and all that, why didn't he do anything with the Fallen? And then they also, and then Optimus Prime repeatedly mentions that he and Fallen are the last Primes, but Sentinel Prime was still alive. I mean, like, yeah, 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 they thought he was dead and all that, but given what they show in the movie, they showed all the Primes being there. The four Primes that cocoon the thing, Optimus, and the Fallen. They don't really mention that Sentinel is there also. Whew. Um, also, I feel like couldn't the people have realized uh, that uh, Sentinel was uh, a little bit more important than that a little earlier, perhaps. Also, even though uh, I'm not really a big um, political supporter and all, all that, um, actually, never mind, never mind, never mind, I'm just going to rant about people not looking like the way they're supposed to, but of course you can't make people look the way they're supposed to on real life if you're going to base them off real life characters. Why am I going to complain about that? It's stupid. Um, what else? I don't know, it just felt a little harder for me to connect to the characters for some odd reason. Although, I'll admit, one reason could be was that, um, I watched all three of these movies back to back to back, so it could be I was just brain dead, I'm not sure. And we've got another director who's just like, uh, shutting down everything. You report to me and blah, 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 blah. I've had enough of that. And Artemis doesn't bring the speech up. We will do what you say, but what if we're right? Or what if you're wrong? I just think he should say that again in this case. So, on the whole, um, in some ways, I did, like, um, Dark of the Moon, Moon, in some ways, I didn't. I'll have to write this better than Revenge of the Fallen, though, because it isn't a boring, ac I mean, I mean, no, 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 not a boring, because for me, it wasn't boring. It isn't just an action flick, there's more story behind it and all that, so, I'm gonna write Dark of the Moon, I think. 
I, I honestly don't know if I can really give it a rating because... Well, we would give it a good rating. Because it deserves more than Revenge of the Fallen. But I'm not entirely sure if it, I should say, four. Ah, what the hell, let's just get it all over with. I'll give it four. But I just feel kind of uneasy about it. Now, it could be that I just need to watch the movie again to kind of appreciate it a little bit better. So I, I am willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here's something that's interesting. Apparently, Sentinel Prime is voiced... By Spock himself, Leonard Nimoy. I'm shocked by that, because that did not sound at all like him. At least in my eyes. Well, that finishes up the, uh... Mummy, X-Men, and Transformers trilogy, uh, trilogy of reviews. <laughs> Hopefully you guys enjoyed seeing all three of these videos, and that you just think... I'm doing good with these review things, and let me know if you would prefer that I actually review, um, movies in a trilogy, uh, like this, where I do one for each trilogy each time, or if you would prefer I just talk about, uh, one trilogy of movies per review, that kind of a thing, I'm considering going through with this, even though I know I've only got a couple of subscribers right now. Well, see you next time.